So these things are so these things are not accurate. Right? That's weird. Can you put it as a presentation? Oh, no, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Why is the way How can I put it on? Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so this is a physiology version of a lecture that I have given several times um, in anatomy and also in grand rounds. And um, instead, but we're going to focus a little bit on on the function of the association cortices. So that, that's just the, but you're going to see a lot of fruit. For those of you who are new, you will not have seen this before. And for those of you who have been here, you're going to see a lot of this is quite familiar. So uh, this will be our outline. Uh, we're going to look uh, briefly at cortical structure and then regions of the cortex that are involved and known as association cortices, their connectivity, their firing, and then what happens with lesions. Um, and what I would say is in general, you need to slow me down. If you, because so much of this is review, I'm just going to be flying through here. And if I, so if I say something and you want to, this is a, this is a good talk to just go, whoa, let's discuss this. Okay. And, and that's fine with me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, that's right. So um, you uh, will remember, okay. That Broadman's map is really a map of the cytoarchitectonics of the cortex. And uh, that uh, for the most part, we're gonna be talking about neocortex. So we're gonna have six layers to the cortex. And uh, that in almost all cases, the top layer is a molecular layer that is mostly white matter going back and forth on the cortical surface. And then there are these um, five other layers that are important, all right? And we'll, we'll be talking about them in a little bit. So we'll come to them later. The key of Brodman's map is that he looked at, at basically um, the gradient, if you will, between pyramidal neurons and granular cells. That's really what this is about. And a type one cortex is almost all pyramidal neurons and a type five cortex is almost all granular. And then two is a lot like one and four is a lot like five. And in the middle is this very balanced cortex where you have clear and distinct layers. I mean, if you wanted to take a picture to, or show a medical student what six layers of cortex were, you would go to the type three because you can see all the different layers. You have this layer six, you have the, you know, the pyramidal layer in five, a granular layer in four, another pyramidal layer in three, another granular layer, so pyramidal layer in three, granular layer in two. And this balanced cortex is type three, and this is gonna be almost all of the association cortices are gonna be type three. They're very balanced because they are as likely to be receiving information as they are to be transmitting information. And we might as well sort of presage where we're going with this. 
most of the information that association courtesies are going to receive are not going to be coming from the outside world. You're not going to be looking at primary thalamic information coming up about primary vision. That's not going to an association cortex. Most of the information entering an association cortex is going to be coming from another area of cortex, okay, or from the thalamus, but mostly from other layers of cortex. And most of the information that's leaving, same thing, is not leaving the brain, okay. Most of the rest of the information that leaves a type three cortex is going to another region of cortex. And for that reason, they're known as association cortices because that's what they do. They associate different layers, right? And then this is just a myelin stain. I always like to show you that we, we forget how much myelin is in the uh, cortex. And so you can see the striation also uh, with myelin. Um, this is what we've been talking about. So you're gonna have ascending and descending neurons and the ascending neurons are gonna come up and they're gonna synapse for the most part on uh, granular cells. And then the granular cells will share that information on the dendrites of the pyramidal neurons. And then the pyramidal neurons will transmit the information out. In general, any pyramidal cell in layer five probably is going to be leaving the brain. And any in layer three is going to be going to another area of cortex, okay? So you're gonna see, as, as you do see, in type one cortex here, all right. These, these, most of these are, are, are honestly layer five. Type one cortex is mostly layer five, and these are your. This is the. This is the pyramidal tract. This is the corticospinal tract. That that that's not the case here, where most of these are going to be leaving um, areas layers two and three and going to other areas of cortex. I love this picture. I have ran across this picture many years ago. And um, the value of this picture is that uh, the color coding is really useful in talking about association cortex because blue is a primary modality. It could be motor or it could be sensory, but it's primary. The, what's coming in is coming from the outside world. What's leaving is going to the outside world. By outside world, I mean outside the brain. Yellow is these are your secondary cortices and they are all related to the primary cortices. So this is gonna be the premotor area and the supplementary motor area that are gonna drive the primary motor cortex. And then there are gonna be areas for interpreting uh, simple here, somatosensory information, visual information, auditory information. But by and large, these yellow areas are unimodal they're dealing with higher levels of integration of a particular type of um, sensory information. But when you hit the salmon color, okay, modality goes away, all right? These are your areas of association cortices and they're really clear uh, on, the, on this kind of diagram. Green, by the way, is your limbic pathways, all right? So now you might be interpreting, if, if it's on the parietal side, if you're behind the postcentral gyrus, then most of the association cortices are going to be um, interpreting the world and creating the perception of the world. And if you're anterior to the precentral gyrus, then most of the association cortices are about deciding what to do in the world. All right. And of course, they have to interact. You don't, you can't begin to know what to do. Okay. If you don't understand the world around you, I mean, to act without understanding. I mean, this is almost, you know, I almost think Hegel, you know, to act without uh, understanding is, is, is senseless, okay? I mean, it's just senseless. But, but to understand and not act is useless, okay? So these guys have to put together, and this, this is really the foundation of what we call human behavior. Notice that the primary sensory areas are very small. Now, I don't quite like this because they have included all the secondary areas, but if you include, if, if you just limit this to what are your primary areas, they're a very small part of the cerebral hemisphere. Most of your areas are, are, are not just primary information coming in. And I have pictures of where I used to live in Wisconsin. This is, this is the morning in Wisconsin. This is, this is what I woke up to every day. It was amazing. Beautiful. It was gorgeous. It was just unbelievably beautiful. Um, again, we've been through this before in the anatomy lectures in much more detail and in some of the grand rounds. 
Um, there is a definite flow of information in the cortex. So um, if you take the sensory information, you have um, very simple, uh, very granular sensory information coming up from uh, neurons of the thalamus, everything uh, going to the sensory areas of the um, uh, cortex with some really very few exceptions are gonna be coming in through the thalamus, very specific pathways. <laughs> and they're gonna be visual, auditory, somatosensory. And uh, your somatosensory system can be extraceptive, that is the outside world. And then there's also the sort of inside world of our abdomen, cavity, lungs, breathing, all of that stuff. And then finally, olfactory and taste, which is where some of the exceptions are, because these, as you know, the olfactory bulb is part of the brain. And so some of the information is coming directly into the olfactory system, especially. Um, and we're, so we're just gonna be, the, the flow of information on the sensory side is gonna be simple in, and then as you process it in the secondary area, the, the elements of sensation are going to become gradually more complex. And then when you finally get to an association cortex, you're gonna be thinking about concepts. That's what we wanna to get to is concepts. Um, okay, and then that, that increasing complexity is the way it goes. It comes in simple, it becomes more complex. <clears throat> the motor system is the opposite. The motor system is, if you just think about playing tennis for a second, I used to use tennis a lot as an example uh, with medical students at Stony Brook, uh, which is where these lectures first came from. And if you just think about playing tennis, when, when you're on the court, the complex level is, I wanna beat my opponent. I have to have a strategy, right? I'm not thinking about how my hand is gripping the, the, the racket, okay? Or even the speed of the ball. All I wanna know is, is how am I gonna beat this guy? I, I have to move him around, I have to, that kind of stuff, strategy. But in the end, it does come down to the force that I exert on the grip of the tennis racket and the upswing, so how much top spin I put on the ball. And it does come down to that. So from the motor system, you move from the very complex down to the simple, okay? So two different uh, opposite directions of flow. And I use this as from the visual system as an example. Um, and again, we normally would go into this in much more detail, but the neurons are tuned to, you know, incredibly finely, to, uh, to specific uh, uh, stimuli. And this is just an example of a neuron which is tuned to a vertical line. Um, if you shine a dot um, in, the, in its visual field, um, you get some increase in neuronal firing here. If, if the dot is on the line, you get some. If you shine the dot in the surround, it inhibits it, okay? If you take a line and cross it, it's mostly inhibitory, isn't it? Because now you're gonna get a little bit of stimulation as you cross that line, but most of it's inhibitory. Now, when you start to do this, then more of it is crossing the line. But when you align the visual light coming in with the native orientation of the cell, then the cell fires maximally. And that's the kind of information that's a, that could be just a, that's gonna be true in the retina, and it's gonna be true all the way up through the thalamus into V1, into Brodmann's area 17. That's the kind of, that's what these granule cells are responding to is orientations. Now, even within the area 17, you can begin to have complexity because you can also introduce, um, you, you can link these cells together and you can even have the cells moving. I think I showed that in the next what's called a complex neuron could still be, even though it's complex, it could still be in the primary uh, visual area. And it could respond to a line of a particular orientation, which is moving in a particular direction. So extremely granular information is what I'm saying. That's the kind of data that we're gonna get. And, and that's true in the auditory system, you're gonna have tones, you're gonna have locations in space, uh, all that sort of thing. And of course, somatosensory, uh, all of the various modalities. So then all of this comes in as a single modality, and then it goes on to the secondary areas, which, like I say, begin to interpret more complex things. That's, gosh, that, that tone that I'm hearing sounds like a violin. Well, how do I know? I mean, a trumpet could make the same note as a violin, right? If they could both play middle C. So why do I say that that's a trumpet instead of a violin? Well, because the overtones are different then. So then I'm detecting these more complex things. So I'm moving to 
higher levels of complexity. But I'm, I'm certainly nowhere near recognizing that this is a Bach partita or something like that. You then move on to, again, sensory flow, information flow in the cortex. You move to heteromodal areas where cortices are capable. And usually these cortices, let me see, if we go back to this slide for a minute. Um, cortices that are adjacent to one another, to, to, to two different areas, are gonna become heteromodal, okay? So if the cortex lies between uh, visual and somatosensory, then it's gonna mix, these neurons are gonna be mixed with somatosensory and visual. If it's gonna be between visual and auditory, then it's gonna mix visual and auditory. But then when you get to the center, the confluence of all of these, that's when you really start to get to what are called transmodal, okay? So heteromodal means it mixes more than one modality. Transmodal is the highest level of association cortex. In transmodal, you see this, the neurons are not influenced by the sensory information of any particular type. What they respond to is known as valence. And valence means how interested you are in it. And that becomes the key. Now, as, we, as you start to get to neglect syndromes and that sort of thing, which we're heading toward, it's really the interest is what's important. And when you start getting to levels of interest, <clears throat> then you start mixing motor and sensory at the highest levels. So if I, I said, I wanted to bring a USB drive to, for Sanan actually with the pictures and without, I made a mistake. I grabbed the wrong USB drive. I grabbed the USB drive, which had this mechanism in it. Little did I know I had two of them in my attache that had the same mechanism. And I, I didn't even, I didn't look, I didn't use my visual cortex to confirm what I had picked up. All right, <laughs> see? So, but I had reached in and fished around in it. And that's when, it, that's when I, uh, I, I it, you, you blend sensory and motor. You blend perception and action at the highest level. What I wanted was I had a strategy, I had a plan. I wanted to bring the drive for you to select which pictures you wanted to use. I knew what I was doing, okay? I knew where I'd kept it. I reached in, I just had not confirmed that I, I just picked up the wrong type. But, but as my hand, what I'm trying to say is when my hand is in there, not looking, okay? And I'm feeling around to get the right, the one that had that mechanism on it, right? Is that motor or perception? See, it, it, it's, it's, I'm actively exploring. I have something in mind. That's the key. I'm actively exploring. Exploration is what it's about, right? Remember, I define alertness, so, you know, as um, actively perceiving the environment and anticipating what's, what's happening next, all right? So it's a very active process. They have no direct sensory, but these highest association areas, they don't have any of the motor component. In order for them, so for instance, in order for the prefrontal cortex to execute a command, it's going to have to interact with supplementary motor and secondary motor, premotor uh, cortices. It's not going to be, first of all, it can't even access the primary, the, the primary sense, the primary motor strip. It has no way of getting to it. Okay, it has to go through supplementary. Again, that's your flow of information. All right, so all of the higher association are type three. Um, on the perception side, it's gonna be in the inferior parietal lobule and the superior temporal sulcus. These are your two areas which are transmodal. That is, they are not interested in the modality. They're interested in concept, okay? And the prefrontal cortex, very complicated and that's going to um, take all of this information bring it together and then decide how to act and together by the way this transmodal area and the prefrontal cortex together especially the with the dorsal lateral portion of prefrontal cortex those areas together are the anatomy of what the psychologists call working memory We've been through this. So you have this perception. Last year, we talked about uh, some uh, quotes from Descartes, actually, <laughs> who struggled with this idea of, of the um, internal perception of the world. <clears throat> Remember that I believe that we all have different perceptions of the world. None of us interact. None of us know what's going on in the world, strictly speaking. 
all we have are mental representations of the world. And that's what we deal with, is our mental representations of the world. When we act, we act because of our understanding of the world. That understanding can be very incorrect, in which case our action may have made sense, but our perception was incorrect. In a way, that's what I did. And we talked about motor planning. Another view of the, of the morning. From your house. Oh, from the house. I just go out on the deck and just shoot. Or the pier. Mm -hmm. I want to go down to the water. Yeah. All right. Cortical connectivity. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. Cortical cortical makes up the bulk of connections. You can go from primary to secondary. Uh, you can go from secondary to association. You can go backwards. All right. You can go from one hemisphere to the other hemisphere in the equivalent region. These are all forms of cortical connectivity. You also have huge thalamic thalamic cortical. Um, you have all of the primary and sensory, uh, primary sensory uh, and motor activity. I don't want to talk about that. Then the question is, what part of the court, uh, what parts of the thalamus don't deal with primary sensory or primary motor? And the answer is the pulvinar, which is very large, the pulvinar, and the medial dorsal portion of the thalamus. And then all of this, you have all kinds of ascending influences for activation of various kinds coming from the uh, various neurotransmitter systems of the brain stem. And this just sort of summarizes that. Okay. All right. And the question is, how do you get from one area of association cortex to another? Can you go through from one, from cortex A to cortex B, cortex C, back down to cortex D? Or actually, do you have to go through the basal ganglia? This is a this is an ongoing question, or most likely in parallel, you do both. And this again, just shows the incoming information. You have modulatory systems coming up from the brainstem going to all levels of cortex. And then you have the thalamus, which really is mainly going to area, to levels uh, four and uh, two. A little bit also on to five, but, and then here you have, here's, here's, a, here's a high neuron going to over, a uh, high pyramidal neuron going to others cortical areas. As you get lower, you can be going to other cortical areas on the same hemisphere or to the opposite hemisphere. And when you get down in five, you're going to subcortical structures. Okay. And, and this diagram is just nice because it links the colors of the um, thalamus with the various colors uh, that are involved. And here's your medial dorsal thalamus going to the prefrontal cortex. And here's the pulvinar going to the um, parietal areas of perception. So pulvinar is going to be going to um, parietal association areas and medial dorsal thalamus is going to be going to the prefrontal cortex. Okay, that's a pretty uh, solid association. And then uh, here are just uh, some of the um, lower structures also that are coming up and play a role. All right. <clears throat> Temporal lobe. So uh, a little bit of uh, sometimes, obviously, well, not obviously, but most of the time when we look at single unit recording, we're looking in uh, coming from cats or monkeys most of the time. And so here we are looking at the inferior temporal uh, cortex. All right. We're looking at how uh, neurons respond at a higher level. So we saw them uh, as they were just lines. And this is just a neuronal firing. And these are neurons which are down here in areas for facial recognition. And look at this. So I just, I love uh, this. It, it doesn't respond very well to this picture. Uh, it, it doesn't mind this very much. Okay. It, it's perfectly okay with this, even though it's changed the face of the monkey. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a better response with the weird face than the hands. Yeah, so so I just, I mean, this is giving you a sense of how, you know, and these level, these neurons get to crazy levels. Uh, there was, uh, you know, I don't know, there's a story of the Jennifer Aston neuron. I don't know if you've heard this, but there was a, uh, a uh, single cell in someone's brain. And when it was stimulated as part of planning for epilepsy surgery, he just said, Jennifer Aston. And they said, you know, what? And he said, no, that's Jennifer. And, and he said, do it again. And they do, he said, yeah, Jennifer Aston. Okay. You know, it's like, well, Je well, what's she doing? 
well, I don't know what she's doing. I mean, you know, <laughs> and, and just, it's just Jennifer Aston, you know, it did, that's all. It was associated with not, not a particular view or a particular sound of her voice or anything like that. Here's, this is also, again, uh, looking at orientation. Here's the monkey looking directly. So even, even though these are facial, look, when you walk down the hallway, you guys, when you sit in there, I'm always trying to figure out who it is when I come in the room, who's sitting working at the computer, okay? <laughs> and and there, right? So, and I'm very conscious of, you know, and or sometimes you come up behind someone and you think, you know, is that someone? And then, you know, you have to go through a whole set of, inspections to see if this is him. <laughs> coming from behind. Does she walk that way? Right, all of that. But but so there is a neural basis to all of this, right? And here, look, here's here's neuro, these are individual neurons that respond more to the I don't, posterior aspect of the head than to the, I love this. Put the brush in there. <laughs> That's probably, I wonder what would happen if they had turned the brush sideways. That would go. Yeah. I don't know why that's there. The eyes are upside down. Yeah. yeah. Oh, here. I know why it's here. Does this picture bother you? I forgot this was here. Yeah, but how much does it bother you? <laughs> Same thing, right? Same picture. But when the picture's turned upside down, it really doesn't bother you because, because that's okay. <laughs> it's, it's not okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> all right, agnosia. So of course, agnosia means, I don't know. And um, we used to have at Stony Brook, we used to have agnosia rounds and where the agnosia was our agnosia. You could only present cases <laughs> where you didn't know the answer. That was, so, and we called it agnosia. Round. At any rate, you can have very specific agnosia, as you know, you have plus up agnosia, uh, which not surprisingly is coming from the superior temporal gyrus where we saw that kind of uh, neural activity. Um, and it's for identification of the face and you would not detect emotion by the way in this particular area. You could not tell if the person is happy, sad, angry or anything like that, all right? Um, what else you have? Object agnosia, all right? Uh, which these are all over the place because not surprisingly because recognition of objects is gonna be all over the place depending on how the object is presented to. One of the things that, and, and then you can have uh, auditory agnosia. So um, Lever Stewart of the Lever Brothers, the soap company. So Lever Stewart was a neurologist when I was a resident at Virginia. And he was crazy and he did it for a dollar a day. He, he just, he, it, was, it was ridiculous. But anyway, one day we said to Dr. Stewart, we said, you know, we have a guy with, with amazing object agnosia. And he just was like, really? And, and we said, really? And he goes, let's go see, all right? And he walks up to this guy and he opens his bag. We all have bags, okay? He opens his bag and he pulls out a nine millimeter luger and he, and he points it at the guy's forehead. And the guy doesn't flinch, doesn't even flinch. And he goes, he just puts it away. He says, yep. <laughs> He doesn't know what Imagine, I mean, right. let me tell you, medicine was different back then than it is now. You wouldn't get away with that today. So, yeah, so same thing. You can, you, can, yeah, you can have phone agnosia. It's like, what was that? You, you don't, they just don't, they're not able to recognize. I know, and that would be interesting to have those tools. Yeah, really. <laughs> So here, but so you can have auditory object agnosia, not just word agnosia, that sort of thing, but that, like what's it, what's yeah, so there might be a machine playing in the background. You, you have a jackhammer or something that we could all easily recognize and the person might hear it and, and not recognize what it is. So these are all agnosias. These are all, all of these deficits are gonna be in association cortex. Now, the assumption is that the primary sensory information is intact. If they're deaf, you can't talk about, you know, phone agnosia, all right? They have to have the primary sensory information, but not be able to interpret it. And all of those are gonna come from the association cortices that we've been talking about. Those are fairly simple. Um, conceptually, they're simple. Um, um, 
And of course, we do this all the time, right? Um, we, uh, we, we talk about stereognosia, right? We, we all test that all the time. You take a key and put it in their hand and let them, and you, you know that they feel it, right? Because they, they're, they're, they're exploring it. But they can't tell you what it is. And of course, usually we use a coin. If you have a coin, I don't have a coin, so I use a lot of keys. More sophisticated and more subtle by far are attentional disorders and neglects. And you're going to think about hemi neglect. So here's the inferior, here's the inferior parietal lobule, right here. Inferior parietal lobule, right? This is the main, and this here, the middle temporal. These are this loop right here, which is Wernicke's area, right? In the, in the broader sense of Wernicke's area. The, the, that's where your perception is. These are your transmodal areas for uh, sensory information. <clears throat> and we start with the sort of thing that we know, but it gets more complicated than that. You show them the house, you ask them to draw the house, they draw half the house, right? You ask them to bisect the line. This is an extremely useful test. If you don't use this test, you really should. It's hard, it's hard for me to um, describe a more useful test for this because when you do it, okay, and they bisect, you just you give them a pencil and you say, here, get the line in half, and they cut it like this. And you mentally do like this. Okay. So if he doesn't see this half, he's done a good job. All right. And that's the sort of thing. You just have to be a little bit careful on the piece of paper. The line has to be, in order to do this test, you have to do it properly. If you make the line too short, so the test becomes insensitive. If you make the line too long, they can't do it either. You start to get into all kinds of other things. It becomes nonspecific. And so you want a line that is at least three inches long, is what they recommend, and probably not more than four or five inches long. Okay, so typically you want to be in the three-inch range. Okay. Right. Now, a lot of the times, the people, and I, I think the next slide, no, I, the, so there's, there's a whole world. Marshall Masulam has a book on behavioral neurology that I love the book. I think everyone, all of you should just read the book. It's a really good book. And in it, he talks about much more complex levels of space. Um, and um, for instance, <clears throat> if you turn the house on the side, okay, and the house, so the roof is over here, okay, will they do that? Will they, will they, will they neglect this side and draw the piece? The answer is no, okay? They still draw half the house, okay, on a diagonal. So can you, are there, the, is this book the one where, they have a person facing the church. The person can describe half the church, and then they can turn around and he can describe the other half. Although you cannot see the church. Oh yes, yeah. right. I mean, so it's these things are very. There are many different levels of this organization that have to do with um, how we perceive our uh, personal space. And this is just a, uh, you know anatomic, uh, these, are, these are different anatomic areas that result in um, uh, contralateral neglect syndromes. And you can see that they, they all are close to Wernicke's area one way or another. All right, the question is, so here's, every, you often hear the question um, <clears throat> whether left hemisphere produces neglect and I always say, it depends if you're a stroke neurologist or not. And if you're a stroke neurologist, the answer is yes, it produces hemineglect. If you're not, then you don't see them until tomorrow morning, and the answer is no. <coughs> the hemineglect of the left hemisphere occurs, but it doesn't last, okay? As far as I can tell, it occurs almost equally in the acute stage, but it, but it, it decays in no time at all, and the right hemisphere very quickly takes over whereas the left hemisphere cannot take over for the right hemisphere. And the question is why? And so the idea is, so this goes back to the question of why we are handed, why there is handedness. And, and the best explanation that I've seen so far has to do with feeding behavior. Uh, and what people have noticed is that um, handedness, if you will, uh, goes uh, all the way back to at least birds, 
and probably before birds. But if you watch birds, birds have a very strong preference when they eat or peck seeds on the ground. They have a very strong preference to have the right eye down. Okay, and and many other animals, uh, deer, others. It's been demonstrated when they eat, they generally put the right eye down. And the thinking is that they always say there are two things that you have to do to be a successful uh, eater. Uh, number one is you have to recognize the food and so pick it up and eat it. And the other thing that you have to do is not get eaten while you are eating. Okay. And so the eye down is dealing with the detail and the eye up is making sure you don't get eat, which means it's looking for novel stimuli. There's, and, and novel stimuli is gonna play a role as we go forward here. Novel is what this is about. That's what the brain is gonna to respond to. Most of these association neurons are activated. When we talk about valence, you know, what matters, okay? Anything novel matters, okay? Anything novel is gonna get your attention. As soon as something appears that wasn't there before, whether it's a sound or whether you are going to attend to it, and explore. You don't have to turn your eyes. We'll talk about that in a little bit. You might, you probably will. You don't have to, but you will be exploring what's going on over there. Okay. What was that? And you're paying attention to a location in space. All right. So um, orcas, the, the killer whales. Okay. If you look at their chins, the right side of the chin is the chin that has all the scars on it. Left don't have scars. Why? Because they eat, they attack to their right. Feeding is to their right. So when we pick up our food, we pick up our food with our dominant hand. That's what makes it the dominant hand. Then when I go hunting, I throw with my dominant hand. Okay? And so pretty soon you have dominant hand. And eating is oral, by the way. And so language over in the dominant hemisphere is probably not far off. And so all of that. But the right hemisphere is still responsible for detecting novel stimuli and not getting eaten. And so because it attends to both, but the left only occurs, only attends to one, all right, then when you take out the left side, you're, you're able to make up for it with your right side, but not vice versa. And that's, that's the basic idea. <coughs> Anytime there's novel stimuli, okay, you light up the right uh, hemisphere. So um, I think we've been, this is an analogy that I don't use very much anymore, and I think we'll just skip it for now. Here's your intraparietal sulcus and the in inferior parietal lobule immediately below it. All right. Um, I, I do think we've been over this pretty well. Let's see. Uh, you know, I prepared actually, I, I, I prepared late and I didn't, uh, this wasn't the one that I used. This is a much better talk, but I haven't reviewed all the parts of this. I'm not sure I would need to go over that. Okay, uh, modulation of attention can be either by the ascending reticular activating system or by cortical networks, which are looking for something. Both of them are going to focus your attention. Uh, this is what I was talking about before, that you uh, it's not only a matter of, uh, if you turn your eyes or you move your body, here's, here's a question that I have for you. Do you ever see um, people with, so torticollis? So th this is something that always confused me about torticollis. Here they are with the torticollis, right? And they look at you like that, okay? They keep their body oriented to you, okay? Their head is turned. They have to move their eyes over in order to see what you're doing. You know, I, I, I would probably change my orientation, if, but they don't. They keep their body straight toward you. It makes it very complicated for them. And so it just points to how much more complicated interpersonal space or extrapersonal spaces uh, than, than is immediately obvious. All right, here's the deal. And, and, and neglect syndrome occurs, and again, these are gonna be right hemisphere nearly always. So a neglect syndrome occurs when the impact of an incoming sensory event, okay, displays a spatial bias. That's what makes a neglect syndrome. 
whether it's vision or whether it's uh, somatosensory or whether it's auditory. The thing is, when it, when, the, when it occurs, that same sound would elicit a different, would have a different impact. It would elicit, it would elicit a greater neuronal response if it were in a different location. That's what makes neglect, is that, the, that there's a spatial bias to the impact of the incoming sensory information. That's, that's the fundamental piece of the neglect. And it can be extreme, it can be severe, or it might not be severe. Here, do you ever, so question, just put your hands on. So sometimes, so, you know, you do double simultaneous stimulation, but sometimes I try to overcome it. So actually I'll just touch one hand and give a good push on the other hand, right? And the person feels them both. So it's not that they're completely neglecting. That's my question is, can I over, okay, I get it. You have a neglect syndrome, all right? The question is, can I overcome that neglect syndrome, all right? Very often you can, all right? So then it's just partial. And of course, your rehab is gonna be a lot easier and that's important information for you to pass forward into rehab. And so it, you also can de describe it as a kind of a probability theory. And that is the probability of attracting attention, okay? Has a spatial orientation to it. Almost the same thing. Again, the key is, is that in response to a stimulus with a spatial uh, location, all right, you, you, you activate fewer neuronal resources, neural resources. And so you get these crazy deficits of uh, uh, here, this is uh, extra personal space of shaving, dressing, eating, all of these things that make neurology sort of fun. But sometimes they can be very subtle. And so as you examine your patients, usually I tend to start my exam on the sign that they're gonna have a problem. Unless I know that they have cognitive disorder, in which case I wanna maximally, and I, want, I don't wanna get into the neglect. But if they're alert and awake and that sort of thing, I'm typically gonna come from the side where the question is neglect and see if they, if you, if you do that, when you come over to the other side, you will often find that, so they might be responding to you on their left side. And, and you can ask them and they orient to you, but not all the time. And, you, and you'll do things as you do things, they sort of, they might, and then you go over to the other side and they seem somehow more awake, more alert, more, more attentive. They are more attentive. And so you can detect through that relative lack of attention to your details as you do things, all right? You can, you can that's a good way of detecting uh, subtle neglects, right? In general, when we talk about neglect, it is not, you don't want it to correlate with the, with the primary sensory modality or the motor deficit, that's not neglect. And, and I said it, it's really not seeing, but looking, you see? So that's where you start, this idea of mobilizing neural resources is important, okay? Because that means that, that I'm going to induce an exploratory behavior. So go back to, Go back to my hand, trying to pick out the right USB drive, okay? You see, if I'm interested in something, remember, we go back again. We said what makes these association cortices is the valence, the value that I put. The value is often associated with novelty. It's also associated with exploration, okay? Th these things become bound to one another. And neglect syndrome is that in response to a sensory stimulus, coming from a particular spatial orientation, I do not mobilize the exploratory resources. I don't give a hoot. It's not that I didn't see it, I just don't care, okay? I'm neglecting it and it does not get my attention, okay? That's really what's going on. And that's why I said, it's not a matter of seeing, that would be a hemianopia. It's a matter of looking. I don't explore the area, that's really the key. And it's, a, of course, it's a, a network. You can see what I've been saying about this. It's not one part. This is everything all connected. I have to have a perception. I have to have an exploratory behavior. Trying to decide what we want to talk about here. Because uh, so um, we've been through this, right? We're good. Parietal components. Yep, we're, we're there. We've got all this. Singular. Okay, the sing we haven't talked about the cingulate cortex yet. The cingulate cortex is not well understood. It's typically divided into anterior and posterior, anterior 
has more to do with prefrontal cortex, posterior has more to do with parietal lobe. Posterior is gonna be more perceptual, anterior is gonna be more motor. Um, anterior is thought to play a major role in uh, global attention, but it's also in a, um, um, both, both parts of the cingulate have to do with, um, with error detection, all right? And um, so here, the anterior global attention and exploratory behavior, posterior is gonna be uh, as you focus your attention on various sensory tasks. Also, anytime you start shifting your attention, which I didn't do when I went into the bag, uh, so then you're, you're gonna be more, th these are gonna involve greater activation of singular. So singular is gonna be heavily involved in um, a task shifting. So Philadelphia. That was my window when I looked at the St. James. In a frontal lobe neglect, um, it's hard for me to separate frontal lobe neglect from the frontal eye fields because of the importance of the frontal eye field in exploratory behavior. Now, frontal eye fields are not association cortex three. They are between two and three, okay? So the Brodmann's type is a little bit motor, a little bit um, uh, association. It, it shares it, right? And so, yes, they make your eyes look in a particular direction, but they respond in most cases to information coming in from the parietal occipital lobe. So you can have, you've probably seen this, that you can see eye deviation in people with parietal or even occipital lesions, okay? And the frontal eye fields are intact, but they're denervated, okay? So, so you will see that. And also, as soon as, as soon as you, as soon as there's a sound, you all move your eyes toward the sound. Right. Okay, right. That's so. huh? yeah, exactly. <laughs> we yeah. had this so many times. Yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you're giving attention to it there right that's part of also poker i understand as you can tell what kind of card a person draws if, if you're not careful uh that your opponent can tell what kind of card you have drawn from uh, where your eyes go as you look toward the, the higher cards or the lower cards or that sort of thing so you have to be very careful um this was interesting i thought that the ventral premotor cortex is also involved in eye movements when the objects are nearby, which is sort of interesting, and especially when the lights are off. So when you start not using vision anymore, <coughs> and you're gonna be, your eyes move, <coughs> if you hear a sound, so the eyes still move even in the dark. <coughs> when they're close in and you're gonna be using your hand to figure out what's going on, you still turn your eyes. Right, there were these wonderful neurons. Uh, so now we're up in uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Again, this is stuff that we've <coughs> covered in great detail in anatomy. Um, but you have these go-no-go no go, uh, neurons. Uh, and these neurons are um, specifically there to decide whether to execute a plan or not. So you've made a plan. It's, 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 it's prepared all the way out to the uh, primary motor strip. All right, the whole the whole neural network, the extra pyramidal system is ready. Everybody's ready. You want to do it or not do it. And you're waiting for a stimulus. You're waiting for the right moment. And so you have these go no go neurons that are sitting there going, are we going? 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 Is it it? Is it it? Did he say go? Did he say go? Can we go? Did it, did I get the signal? And as soon as it gets the signal, then it just goes. It goes yes, and everybody zoom, and the whole premotor plan is executed, right? So there's lots of that going on. And again, we've previously emphasized that all of this is, all of that's going on in the prefrontal cortex, all of our decision-making, all right, um, uh, is going to be a mixture of things. It's going to be a mixture of, of our motor plans. It's a mixture, and that's coming from dorsolateral cortex. It's going to become, uh, it's going to be coming from the ventral medial portion of the prefrontal lobe where emotive uh, uh, emotion and, and appetites are going to be integrated into the system. Do I really want to eat that last potato chip or not? Okay, that kind of thing, okay? And then the, the prefrontal cortex, the true, the frontal pole is, is completely abstract, right? This is all about, uh, we talk about uh, 
um, future memories, which is, seems to be a, um, a non sequitur, future memories, how could we have a, you know, memories are of the past, okay, future is in the future, so, but um, I always say, but you know what, um, you should just remember to look that up later, okay, and that illustrates it, okay, you have to remember to look it up later, that's a, that's a memory of the future. Right, so that just right there in that act, um, you already create that. And that's the frontal polar area. And this is just uh, you know, the kind of experiments that are done. You put the food in the dish, you, you take the, put the screen down, you not only do you cover it, but you put the screen down, you wait a while. And the question is, how long does the monkey know to go back to the food where, where it was, okay? How long does it stay that way until it decays and he starts randomly looking in the, in the two boxes? And, and these are examples of uh, go, no, go neurons, which are just waiting and waiting and waiting, and then finally the response comes and they activate. Up from three phone. That's all. Any, any questions, any, any discussion? Any, it's, they are fun courtesies, and I strongly recommend reading uh, Marshall Musulman's book on the association courtesies. It's a very good section. Yeah. It's this is I mean you're getting into higher cortical neurology. It's um, much more sophisticated stuff, um, harder to understand. I think you start getting into psychology, and the psychology is, you know, you start making behavioral constructs, and then worse yet, you get into psychiatry. And you know, psychiatry is tough. I mean, you know, we get to deal with neuroanatomy, neuronal firing, and that sort of thing. They're dealing with these abstract concepts, which very often do not have a firm basis in, in the physical activity and anatomy of the brain. And that's hard. I wouldn't want to be in that situation, actually. Because, like, how did you put self-discipline and emotional impulse? So it does come in, yeah, you come in through, not just through the limbic system. The limbic system is sort of like, that's what drives the cat and the shark. And at least, you know, that's how I think about it. Uh, or, or a small child. Child doesn't get what he wants, he throws a tantrum, right? So that's, that's direct, that's limbic system. You don't, or at least initially you don't, or you choose the time. <laughs> You choose the time to release this, okay, right? So this is still there. It's not that it isn't here, but you've learned to control it, all right? This portion, this ventral medial portion down here, okay, is, is it's, it senses this. It knows, it knows that you're hungry. It, it, it understands your sex drive. It understands your, your dissatisfaction with everything. It gets it. Okay, and it's going to have a say in what goes on here. Okay, um, and it's going to be exerting an influence in a particular direction, and you may or may not choose to suppress it or not. You might. Um, the I love the scene from Patton, where they're down in the bunker and Patton throws a fit, and he just he carries on and he's just you know the weather and he's, he's just carrying on and his. Um, Charge the aide says to him afterwards, he said, you know, sometimes they can tell when you're serious and when you're not. And his answer was, it's not important for them to know. It's only important for me to know. Okay. So you you release that, you let that happen. If you I have found that at least once a year I have to pitch a fit in the ICU, or things happen to the patients without without my knowing it. And, and once a year I have to, and I mean, I, I'm, I don't usually do that sort of thing. And so it, when I do, it catches everybody's attention. I mean, if I start yelling and screaming out loud, <laughs> it's like, you know, this is, and, and that's how I mean it to be. And I just let it go because I want them to not do that again. Okay, I mean it, I don't want to, don't you change plans without telling me on my patients. So they'll remember that for about a year. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the way it is. So, and it's a, 
Now, I might feel that way every day, <laughs> but you can't do it every day or it has no impact after a while. So that's the interaction. It's, I, I think it's just, it's absolutely fascinating. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. I want to say again, the key is that is the at the highest level, it's perception and action are the part one. That's really the key. That's that's the concept that has to get across. Once you see that, the rest of the follows. I do have pictures. I'm sorry that I forgot to bring them. I have. Do you have a minute? You? Yeah. Are you going to be over there? Okay. Good. Come, come get them from me. Okay. I, what I did is I put them on a USB drive so that you could show them to everybody. I took out all the ones that were nonsense. There are, there are about six uh, decent pictures, and you also like which of the.